family and Beacons Bible Church, I would like to invite all of you to join us as we honor the life and ministry of Pastor Steve Bark. It's a high honor to have been asked to start this morning to uh, family, friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ. Forgive me, but I'm going to read my prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, there is a time and a season for everything in this world. Today you have granted everyone gathered here an opportunity to share in the life of our loved one, Pastor Steve, and we want to say thank you. Even though we are all finding it hard to accept what has happened, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Today, as we honor and remember Pastor Steve, let the unconditional love that you showered us with through his life fill this service. Help us to learn how to love others unconditionally, like Pastor Steve did. Father, give us the peace that surpasses all understanding and light this place with your presence. Let your light shine upon our hearts that we may be able to give our last respects lovingly. Let your grace be upon each individual in this place. Give us the strength to share and remember the beautiful and precious moments that we each shared with Pastor Steve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 139. And see if you don't hear the voice of Steve as I read this. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is like light to you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together from my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. But search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Glory, what will my heart feel 
Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. My very first memory in life was of the birth of my brother, Steve. It was permanently seared into my mind on Wednesday, August 15th of 1962. I was only three waiting in our VW van for my mother to be wheelchaired out of the hospital to bring my new itsy-bitsy baby brother. When I saw him, I exclaimed, he's not so little. <laughs> and everybody laughed. It turned out nothing would be little about Steve. He would do everything in a big way, and he would make everyone who knew him laugh. Growing up with Steve was a blast. He was my playmate, competition, entertainment, spiritual sharpener, inspiration, and best friend. As children, my cousin Ellen, six months my elder, Steve and I were always together. But Steve being three years younger, he got the worst of it. In our imaginary worlds, I would be the captain of a pirate ship, Ellie a mermaid, and little Stevie, well, he could be the crew. <laughs> When we were young, three years was a huge advantage. Basically and understandably, Steve couldn't compete with me in anything. About this time, he began praying and made known to mom that he was asking God for a baby sister. And one year later, Mary Ellen, fondly known as Emmy, was added to our family. Finally, someone he could beat. <laughs> However, by the time Emmy was old enough to compete, Steve had already started beating me. One by one, he would surpass me in everything, chess, dodgeball, basketball, etc. And the bitterest pill of all was when my little brother surpassed me in height. <laughs> At first, it was quite annoying as Steve would run around the house yelling, I beat Ralph in chess, I beat Ralph in chess. <laughs> but eventually, I learned to share in his victories by being proud of his accomplishments and abilities. When Steve started attending Sycamore Elementary School, there were two things he hated, waking up and going to school. <laughs> Part of that was because even in first grade, he could recognize a poor, ineffective teacher. <laughs> and I really hope she's not here today. <laughs> However, by sixth grade, Steve was handling school better, even winning Sycamore Elementary School Falcon Day Award, an award given to the single sixth grader who earned the most points at the end of the day made up of various competitions. This was back in the days before competition was politically incorrect. As for the second thing, waking up, 
Well, I'm not sure that that ever really changed. <laughs> As we entered first grade, Dad, Herbert, encouraged by Mom, Lois, took us each in turn to try Indian guides, but that didn't take. As we got older, Cub Scouts did. When the Cub Master stepped down, Dad stepped up and took over the pack. Mom and Scouting Magazine, working behind the scenes, helped Dad become a top-notch entertainer and crowd pleaser. It was here and throughout Scouting that Steve was introduced to skits and group participation techniques that would blossom into skills that would delight many throughout his life. Steve was also a talented artist and cartoonist. He earned awards as early as sixth grade for art. He would later go on to design t-shirts, contribute to multimedia presentations, and illustrate books, including Increasing Your Personal Impact by Dan Webster and Dr. Didier's Hang On to Your Heritage. When Steve was in fourth grade, I was off at a junior high church retreat, learning what it meant to grow in Christ and the importance of reading the Bible. Steve credits the resulting change in my attitude and behavior toward him as the primary factor that God used to bring him to Christ. So when I consider the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life, I can't help but relate to George Bailey, who, after saving his hero little brother indirectly, saved so many others. Also, since I dedicated to my life to Christ so early, it was reassuring that Steve saw so much noticeable work of the Spirit in my life. I think sometimes those of us who accept Jesus early find it harder to see and remember the changes that the Holy Spirit worked at our conversion. For a man who loved and had so many books, it seems ironic that in Steve's early development, he had trouble reading. But now with his newfound faith, he was committed to knowing God's word. As early as sixth grade, Steve would use the dictionary to help him read to the Bible. He says this practice helped him overcome his reading disabilities. He would later lament that schools no longer use scriptures as textbooks as they did while America was becoming a great nation. Another huge factor in our development and beliefs was the influence of my mom's brother, Uncle Tom. As kids, we would come running up to Tom as, as hard as we could, and he would pick us up and throw us on the couch. Tom played with us. He made us laugh. Most importantly, he helped us think. He taught us to question many things that were presented to us in school as scientific facts and taught us the difference between Republicans and Democrats. <laughs> Steve attended Portola Junior High School. It was during these years that Steve began teasing Emmy mercilessly and with the deliberate attention of, uh, intention of building character. She, re uh, she remembers hating the tickle torture the most. It was this and, and to this day, she feels love when people t t pick on her. And I probably wasn't supposed to mention that. At Orange High School, Steve's outgoingness was a little controversial and polarizing. People either loved him or hated him, but everybody knew him. <laughs> he was the guy who came to school on spirit day, juggling while riding a unicycle and wearing a tutu. He played on the basketball team and was the biggest ham in drama, often stealing the show with minor parts. Steve never really cared for his name, Steve John Bark. It was a little too monosyllabic for him. He actually graduated from Orange High as Stephen Jonathan Jacob Bark. <laughs> in 1981, and he achieved the highest scouting rank of Eagle Scout and the Scouting God and Country Award. It was in these junior high and high school years that Steve began serving Christ in earnest at Garden Grove Community Church. His junior high leader, David Dobbins Speck, shared how Steve and his friends would entertain the other kids in the group with impressions of Saturday Night Live. And he would later serve as a team captain under Dan Webster in a high school ministry that it was attended by about a thousand students each week. Steve put himself through college, working a variety of odd jobs, which continued to enhance his unique skill set. These jobs include, included juggling and unicycling for the Disneyland Hotel, entertaining kids with the Orange 
City of Orange Parks and Recreation Department, and waiting tables at Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. Steve graduated from Cal State Fullerton with a BA degree in communications and, run, and won a Clio Award during his internship with an advertising firm. When the Garden Grove Community Church became the Crystal Cathedral, our grandma, known by everybody simply as Ma, could no longer hear the sermons as the new sound system echoed across the huge glass walls of the cathedral. We knew our family had to find a new conservative Bible-believing church. When we heard the dynamic sermons of Dr. Ralph Didier and saw both a Christian and American flag proudly display, displayed in the front of the sanctuary, we knew we had found our new church home in Covenant Presbyterian Church. Here, Steve would go on to be the junior high youth leader for five years and acquire newfound fame as the yearly gong show MC. <laughs> on July 6th, 1991, Steve married Dr. Didier's daughter, Renee, and became a stepfather to nine-year-old Nathan. Renee was caring and intelligent and creative enough to match wits with Steve. They would become the dynamic ministry team and would go on to win our hearts. Renee's musical talent nicely filled in one of the gaping holes in Steve's skills. <laughs> that was helpful for ministry. Steve finished his law degree from Pepperdine University School of Law in May of 1992, passed the California bar on his first attempt in December of that same year. One of the most important things Steve learned in law school was that he didn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> he now wanted to go to seminary, and God graciously opened the door for Steve to become the pastor of Seaside Presbyterian Church in Encinitas in 1993 and attend Bethel Seminary at the same time. As Steve and Renee moved to Oceanside, God blessed them with more children. On October 8th, 1993, Renee gave birth to their daughter, Emily Leone Bark, and Wesley Ralph Bark was born three years later on December 30th, 1996. Wesley was still born with an APGAR score of zero, but Steve and Renee earnestly pleaded with God, who graciously and miraculously gave life back to their son. Steve often said that his kids were his proudest accomplishment, and he absolutely loved being a father, carrying Nathan, Emily, and Wes on his high six-foot shoulders and wrestling in bed to helping them with schoolwork and teaching them to love the Lord. His children would contribute to many ministries at Seaside. As a team, Emily would confide her woes to her daddy before her friends. He always wanted to hear about their lives and their questions about faith. He would tell them all the time, there is nothing you could ever do that would make me not love you. For 28 years, Steve Renee faithfully served at Seaside Presbyterian, now Beacons Bible Church. They led Bible studies, VPS, Valentine's banquets, Christmas programs, seasonal parties, community outreach, missions, and visitations. Steve would lead kids games and events, including Easter and Fourth of July picnics. He performed weddings, baptisms, and funerals. His favorite part of ministry was preaching and sharing the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. An important part of his ministry was working to help people develop a Christian worldview. He saw this as essential for people to maintain their faith over the long haul. He loved using the Truth Project as a resource and started the co-op at the church, which would have a profound impact on the kids that attended. Steve earned a Master of Arts in Theology Studies from Bethel Seminary in 2001 and was ordained, as, ordained by Seaside Presbyterian Church in 2002. In 2014, Steve earned a Doctor of Ministry from Biola University Talbot School of Theology. But of all his degrees, the one that meant the most to him wasn't even his. It was Wesley's when at age three, he graduated from Tri-City Medical Center Development Assessment Clinic, which meant he was medically good to go after his difficult birth. I know most everyone here today could testify to the positive influence my brother has been in your life. 
I know because you've told me how God used him to either lead you to the Lord, strengthen your faith, or help you through a difficult time. I know because of how God used him in my life. And while I know that he is now rejoicing in the presence of the Lord, nevertheless, I will miss him terribly. I am grateful for the time that God shared him with us. If Steve had any regrets, it was that he didn't have a greater impact on Christ, uh, for Christ on our society, which he thought could be achieved by preaching the gospel and reclaiming our schools for Christ. He wanted to champion charter schools that could teach Christian values and write, a Christ, and write Christian-based history books. He was on the path to accomplishing this when his life was cut short by cancer. After 15 months, he lost his battle fighting cancer on January 29, 2020, in his home surrounded by loved ones. Steve's steadfast commitment and love towards God, his family, and a little church in Encinitas follows him as he stands before the Lord to hear our Savior say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Enter into the joy of your master. So I have to say goodbye now to my beloved brother, my closest friend. But not as those who have no hope, for we have this great assurance that if we have the Son, we have eternal life and will be reunited in eternity.
Peace. 
Well, I wrote down a top 10 list here. I don't know if any of you all watched David Letterman back in the day. He was one of the last ones that was actually halfway decent on the late night talk show circuit. But um, what we're going to do here is I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit and uh, and then the elders are going to share and then the family is going to share. And if there's some time left, I'd like to invite you all to share as well. Um, but yeah, I, I like these top 10 lists. I used to do them a lot and, uh, but most of them been covered. So, uh, I'm going to roll through them fast. So top 10 things that you might know about that you might not know about pastor Steve, that he could juggle. We saw that ride the unicycle number eight, ride the unicycle and juggle at the same time, which is pretty amazing that he was an awesome thespian. Here's one that you might not know. The Dr. Didier often called him a buffoon <laughs> in a loving way. And um, yeah, when, he, when, when he would, Steve would pull one of those shenanigans like that, and then Dr. Didier would speak, man, my son in law is just a buffoon. In, in the sweetest way, it was so cute. Uh, he was six foot seven and could not dunk a basketball. You might not have known that. <laughs> Number four, he's a cartoonist. Uh, number three, uh, he didn't wear shorts too often, but when he did, you could see him from a mile away because his legs were white and a mile long. <laughs> Here's one that we didn't bring up. He, he owned two um, Nissan Maximas at the same time. Okay, this was back in, what, the late, late long time ago. So it was the reason why I had two of them is because one would break down and say drive the other one and then he'd use them for parts. Okay. This was at this point, I said, the elder board got together and we said, okay, we're going to give you a, uh, and he's trying to save money and I get it. And he liked those Maximas. Let me tell you, they ran forever. The best car ever made. Just ask him. And we said, okay, well, uh, we're going to give you a car allowance so that you, we don't have to worry about you not getting here. Cause it happened a few times where he couldn't make it because his car didn't make it. So you probably know that. And then the number one thing that uh, you probably don't realize about Steve is that he, he always wore the most stylish sunglasses. <laughs> so I've known Pastor Steve for a long time. I've been an elder here since 2001. And uh, my wife and I were first engaged. Uh, this was in 1996. We were driving around looking for a place to live. And I'm like, I'm going to live by the beach, so let's go check out Encinitas. We just have you driving down the street, see this little beautiful little white shirt. And it was Presbyterian, even though it wasn't. <laughs> but I grew up Presbyterian. I'm like, I want to get married in a church. And, um, and I called this number that was on there, and I left a message. And then we showed, and I said, I'll be there Sunday. And I showed up and, and, uh, the congregation was wonderful and they were pretty well older congregation. And I, and I was trying to slip out of there and I said, Hey, pastor, we, we, you know, I left a message and he's, Oh, Hey, you know, trying to get us back. Like, Hey, these young blood in the door, right? <laughs> young blood in the door, right? He's thinking, Hey, there's just a nice little couple. They're young. Let's get some, you know, some, some youth around here. And, uh, we stuck. So we started attending in 96 and, uh, pastor Steve married us in 97. I became an elder in 2001. Anything spiritual in my life, he's been involved in. He's my friend. He's my mentor. I've been trying to get a big cry. I've been asking for a big cry. I need a big cry for last week because I wanted to be able to come up here and deliver this. And I couldn't get a big cry. I got a bunch of little cries. <laughs> but I wanted the big one. <laughs> Everything the past, I don't know how many years, 20, 24 years has been here and with Steve. And, uh, you know, once I became, once I became an elder, uh, he encouraged me. Well, first of all, before we got married, he encouraged us. He led my wife to the Lord <laughs> before we got married. And, um, gosh, Ralph, how did you do this? <laughs> I did this at my mom's and I didn't break a 
crack a tear. Um, anyway, I became an elder in 2001, and Steve brought me along. And even though I wasn't ready, and I said, I'm not ready for this. I don't, I can't be an elder. I'm only 28 years old, and I'm kind of an idiot sometimes. So he says, it'll be fine. You haven't seen what we do at these meetings yet, so. <laughs> So you brought me in, and and, uh, and Derek came on. But at the same time, we saw how the sausage was made. But you know, I was thinking the whole time. You know, we're like, how do we get this? How do we grow this church? How do we get this church bigger? Like we're working, we're thinking, okay, this and that, da da, new service, uh, this and that, and and because we thought, okay, big church, mega church. Steve wanted to be a, and he could have been a pastor at a mega church. Trust me, he could have. He had that much talent. The guy was amazing. He could do anything. I mean, he could do stuff we wouldn't even think about doing. You know. But you think about it, today we have a mega church right here. Right now there's 200 people here and there'd probably be 400 if everybody get here. He had a mega church the whole time with all the people he touched. Onesies, twosies, onesies, twosies throughout his life. That was his legacy. Now he never had a huge church that he preached in. Maybe he never preached to more than a couple hundred people or a hundred people at a time, but he did it over the years. Over the years he built and saved so many people. And and the legacy that he's left is just amazing. And I miss my pastor. I miss my pastor. I missed him for a long time. And I want to do a, a, a hashtag. P.S. We love you. Um, I'm not going to be able to do what either one of those guys did. I'm not going to be able to ad-lib it. And I'm probably not going to be able to get through it without breaking up. But... Um, So this has been a difficult, I'm reading again, guys, forgive me. This has been a difficult time for all of us. Not unlike probably everyone here, there is there was a moment that I realized I haven't had a big cry either. <laughs> that it was time for me to begin preparing myself for this time. Um, I don't know, a month ago. I'd wanted to come up here and share a profound memorial. Of all the things that Pastor Steve meant to me in my own words. And it's sort of ad lib, like I said. But just last night, I was reading a monthly publication that Steve and I both loved. And a segment of it jumped off the page. And it gave me the inspiration because I'd been battling with all of the different things. What do I include? What do I talk about? What do I mention to you guys? What, how do I honor Pastor Steve? So that gave me the inspiration. I think it will speak to many of us in terms of Steve and who he's been in our lives. So I've been focusing on standout characteristics of Pastor Steve. Now, of course, we all know the humor. We've talked about that. We all know the unconditional love. We've talked about that. These aren't in any particular order. Um, but these are the four pillars. That came to me. <clears throat> learning. Steve was always learning. He never stopped fine tuning the uh, details of his knowledge. And he was always more than willing to share his knowledge to anyone that cared to learn. And that was about a multitude of subjects. Character. Pastor Steve's character was accurately described in Titus 1, 6 through 9. They were talking about elders and overseers, but man, it spot on. A person could stand in the spot where Steve would stand in controversy. <sighs> and be confident that they were on the right side of right. <sighs> Faith. <sighs> Steve had no doubts of the trustworthiness of God's word, all of it. What an amazing blessing we had to fellowship with our lovely pastor. 
And the next one is freedom. Steve, Pastor Steve was a patriot. He would often say, know what you believe and know why you believe it. Now, he was speaking about faith, but the phrase would apply to his love for the United States of America. He would so eloquently debunk the attempts to rewrite our nation's history. And then he'd pull out some little known fact that would be like that aha moment that just sort of nailed this, the whole thing. Learning, character, faith, and freedom. Now, I expect it's safe to say that everyone here sees these things not as items on a discrete list. but as a description of a well-lived Christian life. Of course, churches proceed by fellowship, discipleship, and God's word. Pastor Steve has taught us to embrace these elements in our own lives and in our relationships here at Beacons Bible Church and elsewhere. I will preserve them as well because they help to lay the ground for that fellowship, for our continued growth in Christ, and for the advancement of the kingdom. <clears throat> I'll personally say that these four characteristics brought me to Seaside Presbyterian Church became, before we became Beacons Bible Church, just prior to the millennium. Although I frequently read the Bible and had a student's grasp of scripture, I had avoided churches throughout my adult life. I didn't think churches were a good place to serve given what so many of them had become. But I came upon Pastor Steve and his genuine desire to share God's word with me in profound depth. He opened my eyes that the Bible was written by people who served Jesus the Christ. Steve discipled me to see also that Peter Paul, and so many others, were, were able to command allegiance, not to themselves, but to Christ. Pastor Steve could describe Jesus in beautiful language. Not unlike Peter and Paul and all of the apostles, Steve made himself a conspicuous example of obedience to Christ. Of course, I, we, can all look up to, at all of them only at a steep angle, and of course, in Steve's case, that's figurative and literal. But Steve's example had a profound impact on me about what it meant to be a Christian. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. And I know that all of it is real. Now, it would be incomplete if I didn't mention the thing that Steve and I shared together uniquely, along with some very special young people, his son Wesley and my son Tim are about the same age. They've known each other since they were very young through this church family. Early in their elementary school years, Steve and I individually, without talking to each other, decided that we needed to find an alternative to the traditional public school for our boys. We shared those thoughts, and we found a charter school and then another. Before Steve called, before then finally Steve called a meeting of interested parents and a representative from a nearby nearby charter school. This began the charter school presence on this campus, which is going today. Bef um, both of our boys graduated high school together through that charter school, but the most rewarding result was the boys co-op. Steve led and I assisted along with some others here with a curriculum twice a week for our boys and others. We knew from church and the school of similar age and one girl who's in attendance today here. They were given a study lab PE and a Christian worldview based lecture or video series which bored most of them to death. <laughs> some of them are in the room today 
that was so crucial for them to be able to step out into the secular world and know what they believe is really real and have the maturity to evaluate potential adversarial encounters. My son Tim is going to seminary. He's the youth pastor here now. You've seen him running around the room. He's right now back at the sound booth. The deepest gratitude I have to Pastor Steve is the 20 plus years he generously invested, mentored, and discipled Tim. I see so much of Christ in Tim, and that isn't because he looks like Jesus when his hair is tied back. <laughs> Our family is eternally grateful. Thanks very much for bearing with me, and believe it or not, this was the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> Well, I was doing fine until Adrian said she's coming with me. <laughs> sure. In 1997, Adrian and I got married in, in Texas, and uh, she told me we're moving to California. <laughs> and I was like, sure we are. Um, but she, she knew a lot of things I didn't know. But anyway, uh, I did get a job offer to come out here in uh, 1999. And in August of 99, came out, and she found a little place for us to live. And we said, well, we have to find a church, because a Presbyterian without his church is in trouble. So uh, I think I was uh, looking for a big church. Had to find that great big church, right? And um, Adrian came, and right over there, uh, Hallie Barker sat. And a 93-year-old woman and Pastor Steve convinced us, this is our new home. Anyway, um, when I met Steve, I found somebody who loved books as much as I did and organized them as well as I did. <laughs> Which is not at all. <laughs> and I knew I'd found a wonderful, wonderful place. And Mick, it's going to take us years to get all these books. I know, but I love these books. I love Steve for loving them. He gave us a home and it was a joy and all of her hospitalizations, he was faithful. Um, in the truth project that came up, I wanted to go and you had to be, you had to have somebody that was certified, had gone through the program and it was up in Orange County. And Steve goes, oh, you can go stay with my parents. And so I said, really? And they're like, yeah, I'll just go on. And well, I didn't know that his room was the same way it was. <laughs> And so I got to stay in, stay in Steve's room, uh, and and I at least was old enough to know what Farrell's was. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I got to be a part of the family in in a really very w tangible way. And he loved apologetics as much as I loved apologetics, and helped me fill in so many gaps of my knowledge and my thinking. And I just love that. Um, I will share that when I first came here and got to be a part of the church and mistakenly mentioned that um, I used to do a Bible study, he goes, just so happens we have an opening. <laughs> and that was 20 years ago on Sunday mornings. But there used to be two chairs up here, one for the pastor and one for the elder that got to read. And if you don't realize the shape of that little, it's, a, it's an echo chamber. And Steve loved to sing. <laughs> And I praise the good Lord that it was your voice we heard through the microphone <laughs> and not the voice that I shared in that echo chamber for so many years. But he sang a joyful noise into the Lord every Sunday. Well, he was our dear friend and pastor. He was my brother in Christ. I love seeing so many hearts that are moved by such a great man. And I always wondered how the first church got through losing so many people before their time. And now we know. But we are to carry on what he taught us. I don't know how we're going to do that. But I really look forward to it because I had no idea I was going to live in California. Because <laughs> the Texan was supposed to. I know. <laughs> we had no idea. But God's love is here. Okay. Um, we could talk all night. We have that many stories, and there's been so much love. And 
I guess I'm trying to figure out what we can say that will give anybody else comfort. Um, I've been sick nearly all my life, um, housebound, a lot of it, a lot of chronic pain, a lot of other issues. He didn't see that. He saw me. And they saw me as, as a person, as somebody who's worthy of love. And one thing that hasn't really been touched on, I think, tonight, he did this with everybody. He did this with homeless people in the street, even if they were, like, completely out of it and having a conversation with two other people who weren't standing there. He showed that love everywhere he went. And in the last year, when Derek's been here during the week, some of these homeless people show up and they cannot wrap their brains around. He was so important to them because he saw them. He saw them as, as people, as God's precious, precious children. And they can't wrap their brain around, but he, he, he actually could get sick because he was so important to them and such a touchstone for, for what's still left that's good in the world. And he did this everywhere, near as I can tell. I mean, when I would be in and out of it in a really bad hospitalization, he, he would be making the nurses feel better if I flipped you know, my eyes closed for a minute. Everywhere, he shared the love of Christ. And he had like a, an intuitive sort of a bead on people of these are the people we can go direct and actually talk about Jesus. And these are the people that have been somewhere along the way hurt by somebody claiming to love Christ sometimes the church, and for those people, we'll sort of go sideways a little and show them the love first, and then they can see Jesus through the love, and then we can talk about Jesus. And I can't begin to imagine when each of us finally goes home, how many people are going to be there that nobody in this room we've, we've never seen, but we are people that are in the kingdom because he did that everywhere he went. And I think it's really important to mention, too, my personal belief system of, of love and Christian marriage, he was able to do that and to spread that love because of his relationship with Jesus, but also because that relationship with Jesus and the ability to love here on earth was fed by you every day, every night, that your love and your understanding and your support and your unconditional always being there for him made it possible for him to have a full cup and have that love overflow to all of us, both the people that officially, you know, were his congregation and his family and friends and complete strangers everywhere. All of that was possible because of you and your heart and your generosity in sharing that if it was in the middle of a really important family function or whatever, and I ended up in the ER, you'd still take the phone call. If it was late at night and you were doing something really fun, you'd still take the phone call. I've, I've never been loved like that in my life. And I think a lot of other people haven't been loved like that either. Um, I have a lot of problems with the church. I accepted Jesus like uh, Ralph was saying very, very early. Um, and I fell in with a lovely group of Pentecostals who were great for the praise part. You know, the rah-rah, Jesus is wonderful and Jesus loves you. But not so good with the Jesus has Santa Claus, where you, you pray for something in the name of Jesus, and it's supposed to just sort of happen as if everything you pray is going to be the will of God. And, um, and the long and short of it is I didn't get healed, and the assumption was very clearly made more than once. It had to somehow be my fault. And that made church, church very, very problematic. Um, I came from a Roman Catholic background, and... Um, parts of the Bible. It, it's really hard for me. And Steve one day said, so when this thing happens to you with the word of God, does it feel like he's yelling at you? And I'm like, that's it. He feels like he's yelling at me. And that's when my relationship with the larger church began to change and my relationship to the Bible. And I was able to become a better wife. And another time he was talking about uh, I think one of his aunts who had passed on many years previously, and she had one little tiny part of the Bible that she just couldn't get past. She didn't understand it. She didn't know why it was there. It bothered her. And she said to her, just kind of pin in it. Put, put it to the side and read the rest and see what you can find of God speaking to your heart with the rest of it. And I took that in and, and never let it go. And uh, I just 
I want to say the, the love that the two of you had has been, and still have, he still loves you. He's just uh, not physically here. Um, it was inspiring to the rest of us, and it, it just, this place will always glow with it. And all the time and the energy that you guys put in all of us will, will always, always be huh, with you, with us. And we treasure you and your family, and we have been privileged to be part of your extended family. Uh, just real quick, make sure leave anything. Okay. Anyway, um, we will be praying for you every day as long as I live and for your kids. And um, I don't really understand why this happened. I don't understand why she's gone and I'm still here. It doesn't make any sort of sense to me. But I have sort of a list of things that just like that little tiny corner of a piece of scripture that's never going to make sense. I think there are things here while we're on earthly bodies that just... The irony, of course, is I think when we go home and we have all this great information about why things happen, it won't matter anymore because we'll be in the presence of God and we'll be so overwhelmed with love that it, it's like, so now we know, but we really didn't need to know because we're home. And um, I think realistically, in terms of what actually happens when, when we leave here and we try to take his example and we try to bring it out into the world, day in and day out, some of us will be grieving this for a very, very long time. And it's not because we don't know where he is. We, we know where he is. He's fine. It's trying to function down here, missing him so much. And if we're going through that so much that we can barely stand up, I can't imagine what you guys are going through. But we love you and we thank you for every everything. I look back over the last 20 years and I'd say 90% of every happy memory I have is in this place with you guys. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Meyer. I'm a friend of Steve's from back uh, in high school. And I wanted to start um, with a poem from W.H. Odin. And this is for Steve. Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin, let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle, moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crepe bows round the white necks of the public doves, let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can ever come to any good. Steve and I grew up in the city of Orange. We went to high school together. We attended youth groups. We went on retreats. We would say to each other, are you up for trouble? He would call me, I would call him, and that's what we would say to each other. And we knew it was just because we wanted to hang out. We would go to get Western bacon cheeseburgers at Carl's Jr. We would play sports, play board games. We would arm wrestle, see who could type the fastest. We would eat an entire package of Nutter Butter cookies and dip them in milk. So good. His mom and dad had a really cool trailer out in their driveway. We used it as our man cave. We would have amazing conversations about church, our faith, our families, girls, politics, and what we wanted to do with our lives. I remember when we went to Santa Ana College. It was Halloween. And Steve came dressed up as Frankenstein. You saw that picture in the video. 
He intentionally came to class late. We could hear him coming down the hallway growling <laughs> and standing in the doorway grunting at us in class, and Steve was totally taunting all of us. Our teacher freaked out. He didn't know what to do. <laughs> and we all bust out laughing. It was hysterical. Over the years, we would stay in touch. Over the last couple of years, we rekindled our friendship and spent a lot of time together. Steve always put Christ first. He was always willing and wanted to pray. He was a very fair man. Strong conservative faith-based values. Easy to talk to. Straightforward. Intelligent. In our friendship, he was always loving. A true friend. He gave of himself unconditionally. I was so happy that I could see Steve the Monday night before he passed away, sitting and talking with him and Emily and Renee was very special. Steve and I talked, even though he was in and out of sleep. I was able to hold his hand and we prayed. I thanked him for our friendship. He was able to say a few words back to me and I told him that I loved him. To Steve, until we meet again. I asked, I was told it'd be okay. Um, I didn't. I am Azariah. Uh, I have known these four walls since I was six years old. Um, so is my family. Sorry, I haven't had a big cry either. Um, <laughs> I've known Pastor Steve for a really long time. And... I've known the Barks forever. Wesley's been my friend, and so has Emily. And I've, uh, Pastor Steve had an amazing opportunity to be in this church, and he took every advantage of it. And he had every single advantage to have one of us and teach one of us. And, and Wesley, you were his son, but... I, I was so close to your father, and so was Justice, and so is, you know, every single one of the youths that went to this church. And we've known each other forever. And and Tim, we've all been so close to PS. He's had so many students that he's taught. He's had so many children that he's taken care of. Renee, like my second mother. Sue, like my second grandma. You know, this church is a family. We'll always be a family. We'll always be together. We'll always be able to care for each other. I love you, Renee, and I love you guys so much. And I know my mom's not here, and she loves you guys so much, too. But thank you for the time. Hi, my name is Andy Aragon, and um, I knew Steve from the college career group at Covenant Presbyterian Church. And I see so many dear faces out there of people that belong to that group. And I have to tell you about um, how much I appreciated Steve. And really, he was just a naughty boy. <laughs> uh, but he had that sense of humor that was a little different, maybe, than other people. And so I'd like to tell you about one of our Christmas parties with the college career group. And um, they were legendary and epic. <laughs> uh, one time it was live crickets. Uh, one time it was an octopus with a red bow around it. And this was one that I had brought my new fiance to. And I kind of warned him ahead of time that uh, something odd was probably going to happen. Anyway, so um, the Bark Boys kind of uh, tried to outdo themselves on maybe the, the grossest uh, white elephant gift that you could uh, give to somebody. And I happened to receive Steve's white elephant gift. It was a sculpture 
of his fingernail clippings. <laughs> so, yes, I just wanted to share that with you uh, to show that um, he did have a little bit of a different sense of humor, <laughs> but I did love him so much. I, I love the Bark family. Uh, Renee has been my dearest friend for 55 years probably, and um, the DDAs as well. And so um, I appreciated Steve for his love for God and for his patriotism and uh, I guess even his sense of humor. So thank you for, for letting me share that. Hello. Um, Steve is my dad, was my dad. Um, so I just wanted to share a couple things about him. First, the thing that I most hope to emulate my father in, in the future, is that he was very quick to forgive, very gracious. Growing up in the church, I learned that People can be pretty mean to the pastor. <laughs> um, pastors take a lot of abuse. And sometimes I would be all up in arms, but my dad, he was just let it slide, roll, roll off his back. Like he didn't hold grudges. He was quick to forgive. And he showed that to my brother and I too. Some parents, I think, if you told them you did something wrong, you would just tremble in fear. But we knew, like my uncle mentioned in his eulogy, that our dad would never, never stop loving us. He told me all the time, there's nothing you could ever do that would make me not love you. And I would challenge him. I'm like, what if I did this? What if I did that? <laughs> and he stayed stoic. He was amazing that way. And he let me question, and he let me wrestle, and he let me doubt. I don't know how I can possibly encapsulate who he was in a little talk like this. Um, I think the main thing I'm going to miss about my father was our late night talks. My whole childhood, he would just come into my bedroom, usually when I was already about ready to go to sleep, and he would just sit there quietly, studying me, silently listening. And sometimes he would say something like, what's on your mind, kid, or tell me something interesting. And he would just be patient. And without fail, I would begin to divulge the content of my heart. He would let me debate with him. And we had just the most incredible conversations in those late night talks. I told him all about boys that I liked. I told him all about my faith, things I was wrestling with, things that felt that were insignificant, but they mattered to him because he loved me so much. He still does. He still does. <laughs> I don't know how I could be so blessed to be so dearly loved by my father. Oh. But I have no doubt that I am. And I'm so thankful that he set such a wonderful example of God's love for me to us. And this, all through my teens, he would come into my room on Saturday nights and I would pray with him for his sermon. He let me teach him things. He let me encourage him. If I had a good argument, he would let me change his opinion on something, which his educated had an IQ 150, and yet he would still care more about truth than being right. And this last year of his life, I called him almost every night. I'm going to miss so much that we love to study things together and learn together. And I could tell him anything, and he wouldn't judge me. But Something my dad said all the last year of his life was the verse, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. And that's how he lived. And that's his 
example that he set for us, and he told me so many times, I want to die well. I want to die right. <laughs> he did. He was faithful to the end. He wasn't afraid. He never cursed God. He was just steady. And he said, I don't want you to fall apart. I don't want you to be dismayed. Now is where your faith meets the road. Now is where your faith is put to the test and put into practice. I want you to be courageous and trust our trustworthy God. He wants that for his church too. There's a lot more work to do. And so like my brother said on Wednesday, we mustn't waste what he taught us. And we'll see him again. I'll keep this very short. My name is Vince Harkowitz. My wife and I just started coming here maybe a year ago. One thing I've learned, I eulogized a friend of mine a year ago. What I had to say at the eulogy, I should have told him. So I did have an opportunity to thank Pastor Steve for the blessing he's been to our family, especially to my grandson. I used to come over every week, pick him up, and tutor him, and disciple him. Angel's 12 years old. He has grown just from that relationship. I thought the last pastor we had was God's gift to us, but Steve really was. And I thank you, Renee, for being by his side. Hi, I'm... Kenton, Steve's son-in-law, his only son-in-law, and so favorite son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to share with you a quick story of uh, when I first met Steve, when I first met Dad, that um, Emily and I had just been dating for four months, and we were very much into each other. And so I decided I want to take a four-day trip down here to San Diego to... Uh, meet Emily's family and Emily's world down here. And so um, I remember arriving at the airport, uh, getting picked up and seeing Wes in his big old wig that he was wearing. <laughs> and then later he grew out his hair to the same length. But, uh, but there was Steve, there was dad who was just constant and very welcoming, just offering up his home, offering up his time just and spent all those four days with me as much as I could, he could. And I remember that Sunday showing up, it was the 4th of July uh, party. And so of course he got the only Canadian to become An uncle Sam for <laughs> the party. <laughs> There's a lot of pictures I can't show up North, but, um, <laughs> But then later on, yeah, we went to uh, to the San Diego Zoo, and um, and yeah, during that time, he heard I heard him call me future son-in-law. So three days in, I didn't know if he was trying to scare me away or draw me closer, but um, yeah, it, it brought me closer. I really like just during that time, I really felt dad's love and so later on he became like one of my number one cheerleaders in my life anytime i would doubt myself he he would bolster me up and he would he would tell me that i could do it he invited me up here to preach a couple of times and he was always quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get angry i don't i can't think of a time that i ever saw him angry he gave me a great example of what a father should be in. I'm looking forward to implementing all those lessons he taught me with Emily. And he always told me never to doubt my abilities, to never sell myself short. Yeah, I really, truly felt loved by him. And so as we say goodbye, I want to read one Bible passage that Dad really stood by that it, it is in the bulletin. It's uh, John 11, 
25 to 26. I'm the resurrection and the life. These are Jesus' words. I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So dad lives. He lives more now than he ever did here on this earth. And that's how I want to remember him. I'm just going to stand right here. I don't think I'll need the mic. That's Steve's father. I have to say, I am so proud of the influence that my wife had on, had on him as he grew up. It was so nice. And he, I love this church. I love Steve, of course. I love my family. But I, and I love my wife, and I am so grateful for the love that she gave to Steve and my family. And I can't say any more except one more thing that he's always said to me. He says, Dad, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. <laughs> <laughs> I am Tim. I am the youth pastor of this church right now. And uh, as my dad has already kind of introduced me a little bit, um, Steve, as we see in this room, meant a lot to a lot of people. And I'm no exception. I... I've been at this church for virtually as long as I have memory. Um, I have thousands of memories of Steve around this building, around this property. As someone has mentioned already, my two favorite memories of Steve were those conversations. Coming here, hanging out at church, being here, doing whatever I'm doing. Him and me, usually the only ones here. And just walking into that office and he's on his computer watching some video, preparing a sermon, whatever he's doing. And, and I just say, can I interrupt you? And he says, oh, of course. And we sit and talk and those conversations could, could go on for hours. They're so poignant that I even remember most of them in my head, the least important ones. And and many people say, you know, you don't remember the words when somebody says, you remember the, the relationship. And, and I will never forget that relationship. But I also remember a lot of the words. He was a very wise man, and he had very good words, words that we should remember. <sighs> Many things he taught me, can't possibly spell them out now. One, I'll share one, though. I've always been a relatively hothead kid. I've always been uh, thinking in black and white. He saw that. And even from a young age of junior high, he was always working on my heart to think more in the gray, to look more in the gray. Um, and the gray is where we learn more Christ's heart and we have a softer heart. Um, black and white have a tendency to have a hard heart. And as we have all heard here by Steve's behavior towards people, he had a very soft heart. And that's something that he always tried to instill upon me. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, there's one verse I want to share right now. Uh, it's in First Thessalon uh, First Thessalonians five. Always rejoice. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Steve is a man that I will never forget that has shaped my life and almost everybody else in this room for the rest of our lives. I'm so grateful to God for the time he allowed us to have him. I'm sorry that he had to take him home but as, we, as others have said, he is rejoicing right now, and we can all have thanks and give thanks now because of that. We are hurting, but we can have solace and joy in that. <sighs> I 
And I just, I love Steve of the family. I love my church. And the last thing I'll say is Steve did a lot of things. And like how Mick shared, he allowed me, he encouraged me, he asked me to do things that I had no business doing. I had no knowledge, I have no experience, I had no idea what I was doing, but hey, say, Tim, go do this, Tim, go do that, we need it. And I'm like, okay. And and I'm so thankful for that because he brings, he al always brought people up, always encouraged them to do more because he saw that in you. He saw things in people. The Holy the Spirit blessed him with many things and that was one of them, that sight. And I'm just so thankful for that. You know, uh, Renee and has asked me just to share a few words and you know before I did that well I've already cried three times so hopefully I can keep it together um, but Renee we, we've had a chance to minister together I've seen you have good days I've seen you have some difficult days but every day you faithfully served and loved the Lord and that's a good thing and Emily, your relationship with your dad was superb, unmatched. And you knew it just by talking to him and talking to you and just seeing that he's rubbed off on you. It's a good thing. Kenton, those four days, he was vetting you, dude. <laughs> He was vetting you, okay? Don't make any mistake. <laughs> but Wes, <coughs> when me and your dad would be together, just me and him, it would always come up about our boys because we each had a son. And we talk about our boys, how they were doing. They're going to carry our name, they're going to continue our legacy. And I remember one day specifically, uh, he's leaving the parking lot. I say, hey, Pastor Steve, how, how can I pray for you? He said, I appreciate that, Mike, but you know what? I want you to pray for my son, Wes. Because I really want him to do well. He wanted the very best for you. And he asked not prayer for himself, but for you. And so we as a fellowship have been praying for you, buddy. Okay. We we'll love you, man. So now we're going to get into the word. We're going to pray. We're going to look at Hebrews. Father, I just thank you for this time where we, as a family, friends, and the truth is we're all family. Just pray that you'll lead this. Your word and your spirit will just minister to your people. And even to those that maybe aren't. And so we just lay it into your hands even now. In Jesus' name, amen. In Hebrews, we see... The Hall of Faith. In Hebrews 11, it says, Now by faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made which th with things that are visible. But by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5, by faith, <coughs> Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him.
By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he became heir of the righteous, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, their hairs with them of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And as we go through that, you see one by one by one, and, and, and the list goes on. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham, by faith, Steve, by faith, Steve is with the Lord. So much so that he gambled his whole life on it. You know what I'm saying? He, his whole life was invested in following the Lord. His whole life. We see in chapter 12, there's this great cloud of witnesses. They're watching after we finish the, the hall of faith. And I, I personally like to believe that my loved ones who know the Lord, they're, they're kind of watching every once in a while. You know, I know that they're, they're probably full stem looking at Jesus. And every once in a while, possibly, just maybe, they're peering down, you know. Wonder how Emily's doing. How's my Wes? This great cloud of witnesses. To me, that's a comforting thought. But it's also a challenge. Because I want to live in a way that's going to honor them. I want to live in a way that's going to honor God by faith. My faith. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In Matthew, we see this verse that we've we've gone over a few times, but I want to just share it with you here. Matthew 25, 23, the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know, he doesn't say, Well thought, well considered. Well contemplated. He says, well done. I think that speaks to us. We still have a race to run. We still have a life that, that is to honor God. And when our, when our time is up, don't you want to hear those words? Don't you want to be received in that way? I, I love what Emily shared. I want to die well. Think about that. 
never once grumbling or complaining. That was Pastor Steve. Stoic, totally. <laughs> Amazing. Nothing could ruffle that guy, you know. <laughs> We'd be in some of these elders' meetings, you know, and some big conundrum thing would happen. Steve wouldn't flinch. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the bait. He just stayed right on track. You couldn't ruffle that guy. It was amazing. It really was. I just stood there thinking, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? How's he getting out of this? He wouldn't flinch, but he wouldn't be to miss a beat either. And, um, but well done. Well done. See, that's for us. We're still plotting the course. We're still running our race. And I can't think of a better way to honor the life of Steve. Pastor Steve, my pastor. Than by finishing our race. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so I just, I just think maybe now's a good time to pray, just for a second. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And Father, we want to come to you and thank you for Pastor Steve. And so many in this room have been touched by him in a, a resounding way. And the tears, they flow. The memories come back. But I can't help but think he, he would even now want to prompt us to live in a greater way for him. Just right now, I want you to just contemplate some questions. Am I as close to God as I really want to be? Am I where God wants me right now? And if you're saying, no, I, I've been closer to God. While we're just out of respect in a mood of prayer, I, I just encourage you, us. Lord, just help me, God. To get back to my first love. Rekindle my heart. Do a fresh work in me. Remove the heart of stone or whatever issue it is. Give me a heart for you. Father God, please. Maybe you said that in your mind. Maybe you said that to the Lord. I think that would put a smile on Steve's face. Father, we want to thank you again for your graces and your mercies. I pray right now for, for just Steve's family, each one individually. Lord, you know the, the road that is before them. I pray you give them strength, mercy, grace, loving kindness, patience. Be their strong tower. I ask it in Jesus' name. And we as a fellowship agree and say, Amen. Won't you please join your hearts with me as we go to God in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this afternoon with so many emotions that are before us, with grief, with hope, with a sense of your presence this day and through all the days of our lives, with questions, with resolve, with encouragement, with so many different things. 
And we give you thanks that you are, in fact, here this day. You are with each of us in this place as you have been present throughout every day of Steve's life and as you will continue to be in the days ahead. So, Lord, as you send us forth from here in just a few moments, send us forth in boldness and in confidence. Remind us, Lord, that your love for us is stronger than all of those different emotions. That however we feel, however we are, we can come to you because of your incredible love. Lord, then remind us that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from your love because of what Jesus has done for us. Not even death itself has the power to separate us from your love. So, Lord, as you are the God who sends, we ask that you would send us forth into the world to do what you continue to call us to do through the power of your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, give us peace, knowing that Steve, even now, is in your hands and that you have an incredible calling that you have given to each one of us as well. We pray all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do God's will, working among us that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.